And Annette, uh, I'm very excited about hearing about her experience with icon and iconography and understand a little bit more about it because it's a whole w different world of Christianity that I'm not very familiar with. So welcome. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so I love icons and I'm super excited to talk to you about them tonight. I'm gonna talk about um, what icons are and what they mean and how I make some of them. And um, so I'm gonna get started by just showing you a few pictures of icons. Is this completely new? Is there anybody who's never seen an icon or isn't quite sure what an icon is? Just measuring, yeah. Okay, a few people aren't quite sure what that is. This is an icon of Jesus, by the way. Here's another icon of Jesus in a different style. And you, same thing on both the screens. So you can look big up here, or that's a little more sharper. Um, and then the other icon is of Mary and the baby Jesus. And then here is another one of Mary, that is Mary and the baby Jesus in a very different style as you can see. I'm gonna talk about some of the different styles. And another one of Jesus, this one I believe is actually a mosaic, so made of little tiny pieces of stone in a different style. Um, here is me with my most recent icon that I made, a little piece of it, it's very big as you can see. And I offered this for auction at the gala last year. And so our very own John Shearer won it at the auction. So I think it's in his wife's office right now. She's an Episcopal priest. So that's very fun. Here's another one that I offered at the gala the year before. And one of my friends in Philadelphia, I think, bought this online for his grandma, his Polish grandma. So this is in a Polish grandmother's home right now. I have a picture of her like standing by it, looking up at Jesus. So that's super fun as well. This is um, the first icon that I had a teacher teach me how to make the icon. And it's actually here today. So you can always look at it in person if you want to. So this is the icon I learned from uh, an iconographer. I'll show you his picture later and show you some pictures of this like in process of being created. Um, it's, well, I'll show you about that, tell you about that. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about my interest in icons, my love of them, my process of making them, but first I'm gonna start with what are they? What are icons and what do they mean and how are they used? So what is an icon? I'm gonna talk about what an icon is theologically, what it is physically, what it is liturgically, like in a life of worship. So first, theologically, there's this line in the book of Colossians in the Bible that says, Christ is the image of the invisible God. And the Greek is icon. Christ is the icon of the invisible God, the image. In 1 John it says, in the beginning was the word, and the Greek word is logos. In the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos was God, the word. So an icon is holy symbolic language that refers to a spiritual dimension of reality. So an icon is an icon of the logos, and it's written, not painted. So we talk about iconographers writing icons, not painting icons, because another way to say this, an icon of the word of God is written, not painted because it's an image of the word of God. So you're writing the word of God. That's what an icon is. So this is a very famous icon. We have a reproduction of it here on the edge of the table. Christ, Pantocrator, I don't know what the proper pronunciation is of that Greek word, but it means ruler of all. Ruler of all, Christ, ruler of all. It's the oldest known icon of Jesus. Um, it's from the 6th century, so the 500s this was painted. 
and it's now at St. Catherine's Monastery on the Sinai Peninsula. It's encaustic on panel, which means it's made of colored wax that's put onto a board. And over the centuries, that colored wax um, just holds the shape. This is very interesting theologically because there's a theology about Jesus' identity in this. If you look at it kind of closely, you can see that the eyes are very different. One side of the face is very different from the other. And it's because it's trying to represent two sides of who Jesus is. Now, an artist took this image, cut it in half, and like made a mirror of each side. So if this side was the whole thing, he shows that side of Jesus. Or if that side was the whole thing, I'm going to show you what that looks like. <laughs> two, two parts of Jesus, two ways of thinking about him. Jesus, the merciful, the compassionate. Jesus, the judge. So there are consequences for things we do, but God is also always compassionate. How you put these two things together into this one image, Christ, the ruler of all, the merciful judge. So that's an example of how theology is embedded in iconography. I love that about this image. And there's something so compelling about it, because those eyes, the fact that they don't match, it makes you want to look at it and kind of meditate on it a bit. It holds your attention. So interesting. Um, here's an icon of the resurrected Christ pulling Adam and Eve from the grave. So there's a really interesting article in the Christian Century about Eastern iconography of the resurrection. It often has this image of Jesus like pulling Adam and Eve out of the grave once he's resurrected. That's Eastern imagery, Eastern iconography. The Eastern church, like the Orthodox churches, tend to have images like this. But the Western church, the Roman church, tends to have images of the resurrected Christ as the one resurrected. I have one image of resurrection. It may be too tiny for you to see, but it's, it's just the resurrected Christ all alone. So this interesting article in the Christian Century talks about how in the Eastern Church, res resurrection is a universal resurrection. Like Jesus resurrects everybody and brings them, beginning with Adam and Eve, brings them into resurrected life with him. That's an interesting theological difference on what's being emphasized in the Eastern and Western church. I mean, interesting to think about and talk about that. It's another example of how theology is embedded in some of these images. And as we go along, I'll bring up some more points about theology that we see in the imagery. So that's theologically. I want to talk physically. What is an icon? Icons are stylized representations of holy ideas like resurrection, of persons, the holy persons, like Jesus, Mary, saints, um, or events like Bible stories or liturgical seasons of the year often represented. And they are traditional models and motifs. So these are all the same icon in a way. This is a model and a motif. But you see how very different they are. But the commonality is Jesus, the ruler of all, has a, a hand gesture he's making, is holding the Holy Scripture. But is anybody here an art historian? I may make an error on identifying the sources of each of these styles. <laughs> but um, some I know for sure. Like, I, th I think that these are both kind of Greek style on this side, sort of Byzantine style. This strikes me as a more Russian style up here. This is most definitely a Coptic style icon, Egyptian, African style. Um, the eyes are very unique, and I'll show you more Coptic icons as we go forward. But the idea is... This is one image of Christ that people reproduce in different ways through diverse styles, diverse traditions from different parts of the world. 
but you start with the same thing, Jesus in this posture, which means certain things about who Jesus is. So here are some close-ups of the face of Jesus to show you what I mean by saying they're very stylized. They're not meant to be realistic. They're meant to be a stylistic representation that says something about the identity of God or Christ or the holy figure that draws us into relationship with that holy being. Um, an interesting thing about the eyes, it's traditional that in the eyes there is no little dot of reflected light. Now I see that, that that artist or that icon writer has put a little dot in the eyes that's very not traditional. And here's the reason why. An icon is a picture of how the holy light of God shines out of holy beings. It's not about the light in this room that reflects off the eyes. It's not about earthly light. It's about holy divine light shining out of the being. So there's usually no reflection in the eyes. But all these little white lines, very stylized, are meant to represent that holy light, which is shining out of the, the holy being. And that's theology built into the style of iconography. Here's some of Mary, similar. The fingers are also very stylized. Often they're sort of longer than you would normally expect. You see the lights like around her eyes and the highlights over her eyebrows. And just to give that sense that she's glowing with God's light. Here's another motif, Our Lady of Tenderness, this is called. The other one was Christ, ruler of all. This is Our Lady of Tenderness because of the way she holds that baby. And look how the baby's fingers are coming around like the mother's neck like this. Do you think a baby's arm could really reach around a mother like that? It's not meant to be realistic. But boy, it sure conveys like this, woo, this intimacy, you know? And that's part of what this shape, this image is. Our Lady of Tenderness has that baby's little hand coming around her neck. This, again, is an Ethiopian-style Coptic icon. And you see those very dramatic almond-shaped eyes. Um, yeah, here is a Eth more Ethiopian Orthodox Christian icon. So this is the Coptic style. You see those eyes? That is a very old one, um, well, that's 17th century, 1600s, uh, an image of the Archangel Michael. And this, of course, is Mary with the baby Jesus. And you see angels up above, like watching over them. This is late 17th century Ethiopia, so 1600s, um, tempera paint on panel. So this Ethiopian, Egyptian, Coptic icon, also there's like a contemporary version. Here's a more contemporary Ethiopian style icon. You see the eyes, that's very telltale, that this is the style we're seeing here. Icons of biblical stories and liturgical seasons where you see lots of characters in them, also very stylized, you see the mountains behind Jesus. Uh, that's a classic way that mountains and landscape may look in an icon. And this, of course, is Jesus stilling the storm. There are icons of saints and icons of angels. We saw the Archangel Michael in the Ethiopian style. Here's one in more of a Greek style. They have these little things coming out the side. These are parts of their hair ribbon. That's a sign that it's a picture of an angel. So that's an example of how the stylized stuff I help you identify who is in an icon. This is St. Stephen. It says proto-martyr, the first martyr, and archdeacon, the first deacon. So remember, he, Stephen was the first deacon, and he was stoned to death. So you see the stones laying around his feet, and he's holding this censer to swing to burn incense in it as a deacon would in a ch Orthodox church. He holds a scroll that says, Behold, I see heaven opened, which were some of the last words, maybe the last words he spoke 
when he was dying, being stoned, he said, behold, I see heaven opened. You know, indicating he's going to heaven now as the first martyr. And then St. Basil the Great, another example of an icon of a saint. So that's stylized stylistically, physically, but liturgically what is an icon. Here's an icon of Pentecost. You may recognize the dove coming down and the little tongues of flame going into every disciple. And here's Jesus at table, of course, in an Ethiopian Coptic style. But, but icons are used in worship in Orthodox churches, maybe in some other churches. And experientially, the icons bring the past into the present. They give us a way to see into a spiritual experience. They might be used, for example, in this picture. This is an icon of Jesus on the cross, something like this, perhaps. And they do this at the Ascension Catholic Church in Oak Park, actually, on, on Good Friday. They take the icon of Jesus, lay it down on risers, and people come forward and bow at the cross, remembering Jesus on Good Friday, the crucifixion, um, praying as, as however they're going to pray on that Good Friday. But this is an example of how an icon can become part of the worship life of a church. Here is our icons in an Orthodox church, and you, this is a priest lighting the fire in front of the icon. Um, and you notice this icon has like metal covering all of it except the faces of Mary and the baby Jesus. And in the background, you see a lot of icons on the walls. In Orthodox churches, there are icons everywhere, a lot of them. I have more pictures for you. Here's one in a church, a Greek Orthodox church in Zambia, in Africa. They have this icon of Mary and Jesus as African-looking people. Um, but this is still painted in a Greek style. It's not an Ethiopian or Egyptian Coptic style. It's a Greek style because it's a Greek church, even though it's in Africa. I think that's interesting to think about how the Christian church has gone into different places and when it has brought its culture with it, and how much it has allowed local culture to influence how Christianity is experienced in each place. So here are pictures inside of an Orthodox church that I visited. It's in Illinois. This is the Serbian Orthodox Monastery, actually, in Third Lake, Illinois. And when I was taking an icon class, we had a field trip one day and went to this church. And when you walk inside, every possible surface is covered with icons. There's not like an inch gap where there's not an icon. That one in the middle is, is in the middle of the building. It's like a big opening in the middle. And up there, you see Jesus, ruler of all, and the lights are streaming in from the windows up there. On the walls, on the pillars, the biblical stories. Um, this one, I think, is called the Dormition of Mary, the going to sleep of Mary. It's like the death of Mary. It's a classic style. That's an image that gets reproduced to tell that part of the holy story. Um, here's pictures of people painting some of these huge icons on the wall. Um, I know this is contemporary Coptic. It's a very recognizable style. This one I put question marks. I think that's a Greek style. I'm not sure where that image is from, where he is painting that image of Jesus. But you see the similarities of the things that are in it, but you see the uniqueness of the style, too. Learning to engage with icons is like learning a language. It's like learning the language of the icons, what the symbols mean. Um, and so, you know, I talked about the holy light, and no reflected light in the eyes. We have the names of the holy people that are written. Some people think that an icon is not finished until the name is put there, the name of whoever that holy being is. 
Some icons don't have the name, but most do. Um, and, and often, like this is written out in English, Saint Moses, Ethiopian, an Ethiopian Moses saint. Um, it's hard to see the names on these both, but Jesus' name is there in initials, and Mother of God is Mary's name there. I'll point that out on some later icons that we see. Um, each thing means something, like, you know, the fact that Moses is holding a scroll. That's a certain thing. The, the hand gestures Jesus has, um, whether or not he's holding a scroll, these are all symbols. So this is the very famous icon I mentioned. This was painted in 1130 about in Constantinople. And she is Our Lady of Tenderness or Our Lady, uh, Our Lady of Vladimir, which I believe that's the word that means tenderness. And um, she is the Holy Protectress of Russia. And it's in the Tetyakov Gallery in Moscow right now. So very, very famous image. So much so when we went looking for icons to purchase for our Teze service, this is one of the ones that pops up. This too is another very famous icon by a Russian iconographer, Andrei Rublev, the Trinity. This is also called the Hospitality of Abraham, uh, reflecting the angels at Mamre when the three angels come to Abraham and Sarah and, um, so Andre Rublev painted it to represent actually the Trinity being present to Abraham and Sarah at that time. It actually takes elements, just notice what's in this. Um, there's a tree, there's a, a house, there's something in the cup in between them, but not really much else. But here is an image of the story of Abraham. It is more full of a story, and it has a scene of Sarah cooking dough. It has a scene of the servant killing a calf, and you can barely see it. There's a calf down there. Um, sometimes you can see like a calf head in the bowl in between them eating. Um, they have images of Lot in here. I can't point to all the stories, but you can see a lot of story. A lot of stories are in this one story of this one picture. This is really representing the angels meeting Abraham and Sarah. But Rublev really turns it into an image of the Trinity, and there's theology embedded in that one too. So this is interesting. Um, these look very similar, right? It's mother with infant, but these are pictures of different people. So here is the name of Mary, Mater Theu, the mother of God. And those Greek letters are on all the icons of Mary that we see. Um, you can tell it's Mary because she has stars on her robe here and here. She's sometimes called the queen of heaven and she has these stars. Um, and the baby Jesus often has orange or gold robes. And of course, Jesus always has this halo which has um, letters, like in the shape of a cross, ho on. Uh, the omicron, small o, the omega, big O, and the N symbol, which I'm forgetting what you call that in Greek. But it's his name, I am. Ho'on. So on all the images of Jesus, he has that cross. And you can see it here, too. He has it here, too. Omicron, Omega, and Ho'on. I am. But also, you don't see it on that one, but also you have these other, this is also Jesus' name, I-C-X-C, -C, which if I was better in my Greek, I would know exactly what that means. It's like Jesus Christ. <laughs> So those symbols are always there on Jesus, too. This one doesn't have this. I mean, this has some English, so we got a clue. Up there, it says Anna. So this is actually the mother of Mary. And this is actually Mary. And the way you can tell it's Mary, well, for one thing, it says Mater Theu, mother of God, same as this other big Mary, grown-up Mary. And she holds this lily, symbol of purity. 
So when you see these, you, you can find out who they are by reading all the little signs, sometimes literally the letters. This is kind of interesting because it has all three of them. So this is an icon of Anna and Mary, Mater Theu, and Jesus Christ. This is, I think this is the resurrection. It could be the transfiguration. <laughs> I'd have to like Google it and check. Um, but compare that to this old image, which was painted in 1403. This is definitely the transfiguration. This was painted by Theophanes, the Greek, in 1403. I love this image so much. Uh, so it's the transfiguration, remember, up on the mountain, and the three disciples are with him, and they say, well, let's just stay and build tents for Moses and Elijah, who are up there in the corners. Um, and the holy light is coming down and touching the three disciples. But I'm going to zoom in on that face of Jesus, because this was painted in 1403. And I think that's such an interesting representation of Jesus by a Greek painter. And I have an interest in the racial representation of our holy figures. You know, and over time you can see sort of the whitening of our holy figures and the Europe, Europeanization <laughs> making the holy figures look more and more European. So I find this image very fascinating and interesting. So from 1403, now we go into more contemporary icons. So I want to show you some contemporary icons now. This is an icon by Robert Lentz, who's a very famous contemporary iconographer. Um, and so this is the Good Shepherd. So very Arab-looking Good Shepherd, which kind of makes sense given where Jesus was from. And it has Arabic writing there, which I cannot read, which probably says Good Shepherd. And then here's another one by Robert Lentz. He calls her Mother of the Streets. And it says Mater Theu up in the corners, you know, Mother of God. Jesus has his Jesus Christ name. And you see the first O of the Ho'on on the side of his cross. Here's another Robert Lentz. This is Jesus. You see his names, uh, you know, the ICXC, Jesus Christ. Jesus behind barbed wire. And it makes me think of that reading in Matthew that says, what you've done to the least of these, you've done to me. So Robert Lentz is getting us to think about how do we see Jesus in the world in different places. Here's another one. Who, modern day saints, you know, Martin Luther King Jr., and he's got his, um, his, his, his number from jail, his mugshot, right? And it says there, how long will justice be crucified and truth buried? So how do we think about who is a saint these days? The Catholic Church has a process by which you become a saint. But the Protestant Church says we're all saints. You know, the way Paul writes about the saints, we the saints, we talk about the priesthood of all believers and how we're all saints. But there are people that we call saints because we revere them, because we have learned from them, we've been inspired by them. So that's contemporary. Here's an icon of a person painting an icon. <laughs> I love that. And I, it's a famous person. I didn't have time to remind myself who this was. It's like maybe it's one of the four gospel writers or something. I can't remember. But he's making a little icon of Mary and Jesus there. I want to switch a little into how icons are made uh, and give you a little flavor for that and then get into the icon, one of the icons that I made. So you can buy books on this. Let us learn to paint an icon. It's a book you can order on Amazon.com. A quick manual of iconography. There's also YouTube videos. Sometimes I watch them just because I'm trying to figure out, like, how do you make that eye like that? Mine looks so, like, weird and wonky. Like, so I watch the YouTube videos trying to figure it out. Here's an iconographer, and he's got in front of him some of the tools. So 
you see an egg there. The traditional thing to paint with is called egg tempera. It's called that because it's made with eggs. Um, we did this a little bit in my intro workshop that I took when I was learning about iconography, although my teacher paints with acrylic paints and I, I paint with acrylic paints. Someday I would like to t learn how to make paint from an egg. Um, but we kind of did a little demo there. You separate the yolk from the white and then you just use the yolk and put it in a container and you add vodka or something like that to thin it out and to preserve it so the egg doesn't spoil. And then you take ground up colored powder, paint pigment, and you mix it in there and that's your paint. Egg tempera, that's the traditional way of doing it. Yeah. Icons are very geometric and symbolically structured. If you think of like a comparable thing might be uh, Leonardo da Vinci's What's it? I don't know if I can pronounce this, a Vitruvian man who's like this and everything is perfectly dimensional. Icons are kind of like that too, to represent the perfect proportionality, especially of the holy, but we know that's reflected in our world too. And, and even the hands, like there's certain measurements that are like the proper measurements for traditional iconography. And again, there are contemporary icons as well. I will take a moment to say too, there are also what I would call holy images, like um, things that look similar to an icon, but they don't have all the iconographic elements, but they can still be a holy image to us and help us to pray. Um, so um, often many people, so, some people are artistic enough they can just sketch the icon and measure everything and get everything proportionate. But often you trace it. So this is showing, you know, a person with a little tracing paper tracing a classic form, like we said, and then putting it down onto a board and then etching it into the clay of the board so you have little grooves that you can track. And then painting, this is painting a glossy glue, you can't really see that, but then you put this gold foil down and wherever there's glue, that's where it sticks. And that's where you have your gold leaf. This is gold leaf. And, and, and that's what you see here. He has put gold leaf down for the halo of this figure. I think it's an image of Jesus. So that's some of the basics. Then when you start painting, there's something very theological about the style of painting. When you're painting like a painter, painterly, if you were gonna paint one of these pictures, you might put down some mid-tones, then put in the dark tones, and then put in the highlights, the bright tones. If, if you were just painting, that's what you do. But if you're making an icon in the traditional way, first you put in the darkness and then the light begins to emerge from the darkness. I'm gonna show you a picture of this now. So you paint in layers. You begin with the, the dark tones and then you put your first highlight, which is all these, all these orange colors on the neck, you see this, the triangles on the face. The holy light is just starting to come out a little. And then you put the second highlight. On top of that, you put a slightly lighter one on the highest parts of the cheek and on the nose and, and on the neck. You start to fill that in a little more. A little bit of color goes in. And finally, you put the third highlights, which are those very stylized lines that are making that holy light feel pop. And this is theological to paint in layers. And this is something you have to learn. Like, as someone who paints, like, I am trying to relearn how to actually paint that way because um, it's really hard actually. <laughs> Here's another uh, representation of it. You start with the outline, you put those first highlights in. Again, that's the first highlight again. I just put it so you could compare and they're bigger than the smaller highlights go on top of that. So those parts are even brighter and then finally those parts are like the brightest parts the layers show the holy light coming out. So these are pictures from my Instagram. When in 2018, I went to the Siena Center. Some of you may know that's where Vicki Curtis now is. The Siena Center is a monastery and they often do classes. You can go and stay for a week or a weekend. 
So I went for an icon painting class way back in 2018 when Vicki was still here at the church. And it was like this, this big classroom uh, with all these tables and everybody was gonna learn how to paint the same icon. And those icons are, this is my teacher and these are some of his icons. And they were all there in the front of the class and we all got our seat here. Um, that's my teacher, Drajan Dupour, and um, he's, you know, just teaching the class. We started with this. Everybody started with the same image, and we made our tracings and painted it on our boards. And I'm going to show you with mine the thing about layers on the face. So this was when I was being coached, and I was really trying to learn how to do it. So first, I don't know if you can see that. First, there's just like the outline. I've painted over it with the dark base coat. You can still sort of see the outlines of all the shapes. And like the eyebrows are hollow. And the next thing you do is you, you draw in the darkness. You, you strengthen that outline so you can still see it in the paint. Now it's not just outlines. It sort of starts to look like shadows. And then the first highlight goes on. So this next color, the light's starting to come out. Here, again, that's the first highlight. And this is actually finished because I think I forgot to take pictures. On. <laughs> I was like so involved, like between these two pictures. But you can still kind of see. So that was the first highlight. And then like starting about there, you see the second highlight. And then really close to the eyes is like the third highlight that really makes the light pop out. Um, so from the very beginning to the darkening of the, to the first light, to the finished. So as you're painting it. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And the same thing is happening to Jesus too. If you notice that, the same thing is happening. And the same thing is happening to the robes and everything. Notice in the last one, she finally has the stars on her robe. Yes. Okay, yeah, take a look at that. That's a good point. Yeah, much clearer. Um, so now I'm going to show you what the model was. This next one is not mine. This was the model we were given at the beginning of class. And then this was mine. So, yeah, pretty good. One of my better ones. <laughs> That was super fun. And that is here if you want to look at it up close. And actually, all of this is actual gold leaf around it. Um, it kind of has some little wrinkles in it that turn out to look cool. I don't think it's supposed to. <laughs> but the wrinkles kind of make it look old or something. Um, yeah, so take a look at that. Yes? What kind of brushes do you use? Or do you use other things other than brushes? Brushes, yes. In the class, they gave us just a pretty and expensive artist set of four brushes, all fine point. But some of the other people in the class who had more experience brought some other brushes. So I use different kinds. Sometimes I like a somewhat flat brush that has like a, like a curved edge like that. Um, I'll try not to get too detailed. Some of them must have been sort of fine to get, because there's a lot of detail. Yes, yes. You do need very fine brushes, and you need to practice making very fine lines. Brushes that are called liner brushes, they have very long bristles. Also, it's very important how runny the paint is. So the teacher would just keep saying, paint too thick, paint too thick, paint too thick. And it, it gets to be like when it really, it needs to flow out of the brush almost like a thick ink. Uh, and you just have to keep learning how to make that, uh, that runny. And it, and it takes getting used to because you think paint should be more like paint thick. But when it's thick, it just gets goopy and gobby. It doesn't it just come out good. Jeannie. Do you see this as your own spiritual practice? And so the actual process, did you find yourself, mm. I don't know, what were sort of like spiritual insights? Yeah. I, mean, I could just see that yeah. emerging, but yeah. is that something that That's, happens? It's a fantastic question. Um, because you're, you're doing two things. You're 
you're trying to remember the theology that you're painting, you're trying to remember the holiness you're trying to encounter, but you're also developing skills, practical skills, like how runny should the paint be, and those eyeballs look crooked. Um, so it's very easy, and especially in the beginner stage, I'm often in the, those eyeballs look crooked stage. Um, looking back on it, I love, to think about that, and it was fun putting those four pictures together, which I did Instagram the whole thing. Um, so I was able to go to my Instagram and pull those out for this. They do have, there's a tradition of praying before you begin to paint each day, each time that you're gonna paint. There's a particular prayer that you would read, and we did it in the class. Um, so I would like to get to a point or I am able to be, to feel more spiritually connected while I'm doing it. I think part of the spiritual practice too is encountering myself when I'm trying to learn to paint it and dealing with my own sense of imperfection and, you know, letting go of that and trying to find the joy in the process and trying to accept whatever is coming out. I think that's part of the spiritual practice for me too. And I don't know how it is for like more advanced iconographers, like my teacher is amazing. At one point I was like, help, I messed up Jesus's eyebrows. <laughs> and he just came and he was like, ding, ding, done. You know, so I don't know what it's like for him. Um, and maybe I'll be able to ask him one day. Um, we can have some more questions. Oh, this is a called Our Lady of the Sign. So each style kind of has its own name. Our Lady of the Sign is a reference to the book of Isaiah, where it says, um, and she shall have a child, and we shall call him Emmanuel, God with us. So this is Mary showing the sign that she's going to have the holy baby. Um, here is Our Lady of Tenderness. This is the one that I just most recently painted that the shearers now have. I feel like I'm starting to get it with the light. Uh, part of the challenge is when you start putting in that light, I keep turning the faces whiter and whiter. Uh, so how do you let the face be dark but have that light feel bright? part of the challenge, Our Lady of Tenderness. I love that hand, and this hand around the head, the baby hand, is like even more wacky. Like, how could that even be at that angle? But that is a classic form of this image. Here's one I painted of St. Stephen. It's not completely traditional. I used the, as a model that one I showed you earlier. Um, it's not completely traditional because I painted it for Andy McGann. He, he won this in the auction in the gala the first time I put an icon. I said, an icon of your choice. He said, I want an icon of St. Stephen, and I want it to reference the, uh, the Grateful Dead song <laughs> <laughs> that mentions St. Stephen. And in that song, there's something about the foam of the ocean. That's not in a traditional painting of St. Stephen. I added that for him. Uh, this little rose actually is like a little Grateful Dead rose. <laughs> if you look at Grateful Dead album covers, they have a rose, something like that. So uh, traditional iconographers might be horrified that I did that, <laughs> but I did it. This is an image of Sophia, wisdom. Traditional images of Sophia are like all bright red. Like, because Sophia is like the energy of creation. Um, but I wanted to find a way to paint her that wasn't just like red light. So if you look at this up close, the face looks like it has dust in it because I actually put like gold flecks in it as a, another way to show like that energy of creation in it. And I'm learning so much as I try to do these. This image has a ton of theology in it because notice whose name is here, Jesus Christ. But then Sophia on the top. So, so sometimes Jesus is, well, Jesus is the Logos and Sophia 
is kind of the logos. In the book of Proverbs, it says, in fact, I quote it here, Proverbs 8, 27, I was there when God created. Sophia was there at the beginning of creation. And if we connect that to John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, it's like Sophia and Jesus. There's a, a tradition of iconography that represents them together like this. But yet, it ha this, this image has wings, like as though it were an angel. Um, and yet it has a crown because it's king of the universe and it's Jesus Christ, like the sun and the moon, the creation. Um, and there are other angel images that are similar that aren't Sophia, that are called, um, it's, I think it's, it's called something like silence. It's like the spirit of silence or the angel of silence, stillness. Um, but then also this holy cruciform scepter is another sign of Jesus. So there's a lot in here. Um, Vicki Curtis now has this one. I tend to give my icons away. <laughs> I need to paint some and keep them. I painted this one for Sean Fiedler. Um, that is Joseph and baby Jesus. Usually we see Mary and baby Jesus. Um, and also that Joseph's eyes are closed is very, very uncommon because mostly the icon's eyes are open because they're meant to see you and they're meant to be a way for you to see the holy figure. Um, but I love how Joseph's eyes being closed convey this intimacy. Like he is so with that baby. And I, I love that, that love in that image. And similarly, I made Jesus' eyes closed in this one. And I had a model. I had a model of an icon that had this Jesus with his eyes closed and this lamb with the lamb's eye closed, Jesus the good shepherd. Again, I think because that's a theological idea that I resonate with so much. God's love for us, our intimacy with God, you know? So I love seeing that in an image. Here's a close-up of that Jesus face. The Good Shepherd. So that's all the images that I have for you. Uh, maybe I'll show you a thing or two off the table, and I'm open to more questions, too. Roger. In so many of the depictions of Jesus, he's holding a book something that has word, what's, what's the significance of that? Yeah, um, that's generally the scripture, the holy book. Um, sometimes it's a scroll, sometimes it's the book with jewels all over it, like in that one there, um, scripture. The, the word of God, a different form of the word of God, yeah. So it helps to identify him Yes. By the fact that the book is there. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep, in that one, it's the book, it's the hand gesture, it's the cross inside the halo, and the name. And the, you know, the mustache and the beard is also very classic Jesus. You see it even there in that Good Shepherd one. Um, I will bring this one over because this is kind of fun. I just bought this one in Bethlehem when I was there with the choir. John Shearer bought a different version of it. She's called Our Lady of Bethlehem. And I bought it because there's something about this I had never seen in all my studies. And it's unique to Our Lady of Bethlehem, which just means it's unique to the way Bethlehemites represent Mary. Her hands are silver. And in some of them, Jesus' hands are silver too, and there's a silver orb that Jesus is holding. So all this silver, and it shimmers in the light, represents their purity. In, in John, I'm pretty sure John's version of this, Jesus' hands are silver too. In mine, it's just Mary and the orb that Jesus is holding are silver. She also is kind of smiling in this one too, which is a little unique. Uh, for images of Mary. Often she seems quite sad, like in Our Lady of Vladimir there. 
So I, I just loved the uniqueness about this. It was made in Greece, but being sold in Bethlehem because it's Our Lady of Bethlehem. Yeah. Yes, Bobby. I'm curious about the ra racial uh, perspective of the icons. Yes. Because, you know, if, when you look at Jesus' icons, they go from Caucasian to brown to black. Yeah. So can, can you comment on the theological and the historical uh, perspective of our Yeah. Um, yeah, there is some talk about that. And there's an iconographer who is also, I think, I think in Bethlehem or Jerusalem, I'm forgetting. He has a little video about it where he found some classic images, like that one that I put up of the, uh, of the, well, was it the Transfiguration? Yeah. And he has found other old ones that represent, where you see like the darkness of Jesus' skin, but then he will show that old image and put next to it like European images. And in the old images, you see the holy light, like it's around his eyes. I don't know if you can see it better on that screen, probably. The holy light is there, but as the, the holy light over time, especially in the European copies, that whiteness got bigger. Like I was saying, you can, you can sort of make the whole face white if you put too much light there. But I think sometimes people interpreted the holy light as a skin color. You know, and that went with a kind of racialization, or maybe we could even say a racism, of focusing on the white identity as the more holy identity. And that's one of the ways that racism has been embedded in the history of our faith. Um, you don't see it as much in the Ethiopian icons, um, but that's... It's a question for conversation to look at how have things evolved over time. And I think that's one of the reasons that I tend to make very dark-skinned icons. And Robert Lentz also tries to give lots of examples of darker-skinned holy figures to affirm the holiness. Any other thoughts or questions? You mentioned in the beginning that I have any word of God. Therefore, and you show people sketching otherwise, is there sort of like an approved list of what is a proper subject and icon? Yes, great question. Yeah. Yeah, and um, there's the question of what is an icon, what makes an icon, and there's some disagreement about that. So, some very Orthodox, Christian Orthodox people would not think that an image of the Holy Family would ever be an appropriate icon, or, but especially not an image of Joseph and Jesus, because they don't see Joseph as a holy figure because he was a human man. Even though he raised Jesus, he shouldn't get a halo. And the pictures of him aren't icons within that strict traditional way of thinking about it. Um, I could show you other images people have made that look very much like the Trinity, but they're very stylized in different ways. Maybe they don't have the holy names, or they look a little more modern or stark. Um, and so some people would say, well, those aren't really icons. They aren't for liturgical use in a church setting, and they don't have the theological meaning that we believe in. For example, Joseph. We don't believe he should have a halo. He's not holy. That's our theological belief. So a, a, an icon can present different theological ideas. So I'm definitely one who will veer into the holy image and away from the icon because I'm trying to present contemporary theology and ideology. Um, I think that one might be accepted as an icon. That one that I made in the class has all the aspects and um, yeah, so it's, it's a big question. Yeah. George. I'm noticing the position of the hand there, it's unique. Um, yeah. There something about that? There is. I think that this somehow represents like Greek letters. I think it means something about Jesus. I can't remember what it is. But it's some kind of blessing or sign that Jesus is giving to the people. And often, it is often. That one's a little bit different. There, it's the two fingers are out. So I'm not able to just off the top of my head. I can't remember.
but it's definitely significant. Yes. Yeah. If someone, if an icon was made with Jesus and Mary, but that hand wasn't there, mm. it couldn't be the tenderness one, it would have to be something else. It might be something else. There are some like that. There are books of all the different icons, and some the hand isn't there, and it's still called Our Lady of Tenderness because all the other aspects are. Um, their faces are touching, you know. Um, yeah, so that's one example where that difference might be acceptable to be called the same model, the same image. Yeah. Well, there's no like, icon for people. <laughs> I mean, there kind of there kind of is like a canon of the traditional icons. Um, I don't know where that's documented or, you know, but I've definitely, I've got books, actually thick books, where you can flip through and read the names of all the different icons. There might be some that aren't in there. There's, there is a style of icon that shows Mary nursing the baby, and you kind of see a little bit of her breast. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, wow, you know, yeah. Well, um, feel free to question me about this at any time, and feel free to take a gander at some of the icons up here. Um, there is another one I'll flash before you, which is, this is a picture of an icon, but we actually, this, our church has this icon actually painted on board. John Shearer has it in his office right now. This is a reproduction of it. Um, it's two angels holding an orb with Jesus in it. Um, so, yeah, that's an interesting, you might, you might want to look at that too. All right, thank you very much.